will, I want you to get out your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Amos. I've rambled on long enough. I want you to turn with me to the book of Amos. Amos is a minor prophet in the Old Testament. I want you to look with me in Amos chapter 7. We will begin reading in verse 14. If you'll please stand with me this morning for the reading of the word. I recently had a couple of people ask me about uh, the Bible that I use and so forth. I use the English Standard Version, the ESV. Um, I have no problem with people using New, New King James, King James, NIV, N NLT. What, get whatever Bible that you feel confident with that you can read and comprehend what you're reading. But I personally use the English Standard Version because in my opinion, this is opinion, the English Standard Version Study Bible is the best study Bible outside of the Dakes Annotated Study Bible, which is, which is King James, that I've ever found. The ESV is a great, great, great study Bible. So, if you will, I want you to look with me in Amos chapter 7. They're going to have the verses up on the screen. Then Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, nor am I a prophet's son. Notice he says, I'm not a prophet, and I have no heritage of this. But I was a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore figs, but the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, go and prophesy to my people Israel. Let's pray. Father, I pray over the few minutes that as we break the bread of life, Lord, allow me to reach out and touch your people. And when I pull my hands back, Lord, I pray that they'll have the fingerprints of God on their life as we move through your spirit to pursue your will. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. You can be seated this morning. In the book of Amos, chapter 7, we're introduced to a minor but yet obscure prophet who was tasked with a purpose that was made manifest when the purpose of God was revealed in his life. It's in this text that we see a great dichotomy presented between the purpose of God and how that will inevitably begin to conflict with the purpose of man. Amos, by his own admission, did not have a heritage of the prophetic. He had no family lineage of prophets, and there was no logical reason for the call or even a reasonable explanation as to why the God of Israel chose to use Amos to be a prophet to the nations. As I pondered over the opening text in prayer, there are, for me at least, some unique points of connection that seem to manifest for me when I read this text. Number one, he was not a prophet. Number two, he had no legacy. He had no heritage. He was not a son of a prophet. He was simply, check it now, he was simply going about his daily life. He was simply going about what was normal. He was simply taking care of his father's sheep and he was tending to some sycamore trees and the Lord decided to take him. And like Amos, many of us, we're just going through life. We were simply living. We were simply going about our own business, minding our own business, and doing our own thing, and going about our daily lives. And the Lord, without no reason whatsoever to us, just decides to take us and change our lives and set a new trajectory for our lives that we could have and never dreamed possible. I know that this is the case for me personally because on December 12th of 2003, I should have lost my life and woke up in hell. But God took me. He stretched his hands down towards me from heaven. And he snatched me out of the grips of drug and alcohol abuse. And he literally has turned my life around. And he has set my life on a trajectory that I never thought possible. I don't know about you this morning. But I'm thankful that he was willing to look past my faults and see the possibilities of what he could turn me into. I'm thankful that he was willing to step into the mess that I had made out of my life and take me. I'm reminded of the words of the Apostle Paul whenever he noted to the church at, at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 11. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scripture, 
that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scripture, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have already fallen asleep. Notice Paul is talking about these 500 people who witnessed Jesus' ascension. And he says more than 500 of them saw this happen, but not all of them are dead. Some of the ones who witnessed his ascension are still alive and amongst you. Then he appeared to James and then to the apostles and then last of all, as to one that seemed to be untimely born. I know that was me. That there was an untimely birth for me. That there was no reason. You have to understand that this is the same Paul who was originally Saul. Who literally held the, the cloaks of the mob who stoned Stephen to death. He was the very one who had gone to the magistrate and got legal approval to go forth and to arrest men and women of God in the local church. And not only flog them or beat them to death, but also throw them into jail. Paul was a an old school terrorist. And last of all, <coughs> excuse me, as one untimely born, he appeared to me. For I am the least of the apostles. I'm unworthy to be called an apostle because notice this, I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And I thank God that just as Paul can say that, that by the grace of God, I am today what I am because of him and not because of me. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And I thank God that his grace toward me was not in vain. And on the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but it was the grace of God that is with me. Whether then... It was, or I or they, so we preached, and so you believed. I want you to notice here with me in verses 9 and 10. For I am the least of the apostles. I'm unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the, the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me was not in vain. How many of y'all are thankful that his grace towards you this morning was not in vain? That it was not in vain? That it was not in vain? Paul, by his own admission, was not even worthy to be called an apostle because of the manner of which he persecuted the church and even went as far as coordinating the stoning of Stephen in the book of Acts. But just as Christ chose Paul, he chose you and he chose me and he chose everyone around you that the Lord is able to take whomever he chooses and turn a mess into a miracle. To use that for his glory though we have no glory to offer him in return. I'm just like Paul today. I thank God that by the grace of God I am what I am today and that his grace towards me and his grace towards his church was not in vain that it was not empty and that it was not purposeless how many of us like Amos have taken a moment to look back at our life and could honestly say that we still even to this day do not understand why or even rather what Jesus saw in us in the beginning to be willing to pursue us even while we were yet afar from him. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful that he came looking for me. I'm thankful that he pursued me. I'm thankful that he looked past all of the hurts in my history and my habits and my hang-ups and my shortcomings and my lack of self-control and my sin. And in exchange for that, he was willing to give me soundness in my mind, soundness in my faith, a firm foundation to, to stand on, a church family to call my own, a faithful wife and two beautiful little boys and a fruitful ministry and a home hope that does not allow me to be put to shame. I'm glad this morning, just like Amos, that the Lord stepped in to the mess that I had made of my life and was still willing to take me anyways. And many of you in this room can attest to that same sentiment because if the Lord had not stepped into your situation and took you, some of you even by force of will, well, pastor, we are free will and moral agents. How many of y'all heard that? Well, that didn't work very well for Jonah, now did it? Jonah was demanding free will and God gave him free will. Listen to me whenever you get past 
your free will and your moral agency and you come to the resolve that God is God all by himself. That man without God is nothing, but God without man is still God. He doesn't need you, but he uses you anyways. Well, I have a free will. Jonah tried that too. It got so bad that folks was willing to throw his tail off the boat just to get a storm to stop. Sometimes people got to throw you overboard because you're going in the wrong direction. Mama and daddy, stop enabling. Well, I love my baby. You're going to love them to hell. Sometimes folks got to fall. Sometimes folks got to break. Sometimes folks have got to hit the, the floor without mama and daddy padding that fall. Sometimes a broken state is the best state because here you are praying for a breakthrough in your baby, but God's not going to give them breakthrough until he breaks them. I know all about that. My mama for four and a half years pacing the, the floor, praying in the Holy Ghost, prophesying, anointing my bed with oil, and I was living like hell. Coming home, stoned, drunk, smelling like a brewery, knowing I wasn't living right, and there my little mama was in the living room at one, two o'clock in the morning, praying in the Holy Ghost. I can remember sneaking into my bedroom, drunk out of my mind, praying to God that I would fall asleep before my mama came in my bedroom and started praying over me. Sometimes you got to be willing to let go of some stuff so you can start doing stuff that matters. I can remember my mama, when she'd meet me at the door, she said, boy, don't you bring that devil up in this house. I'd be so mad I wanted to fight her. But then I knew my daddy would beat me to death in Jesus' name and speak in tongues while he did it. But just like Paul... And just like Amos, some of us have to be willing to do what God is telling us to do, even when it doesn't feel good. And you're eventually going to run out of track if you're not careful. Some of you would not even be here this morning to testify to the saving power of the cross had not God stepped in and took you in spite of yourself. Can I get an honest amen this morning? I feel like preaching today. Point number one, the purpose of man does not reserve the right to alter the purpose of God for your life. Some of you cannot divorce your past because people are constantly reminding you of your connections to it. About 12, 13 years ago, my wife and I were riding with a, a group called CMA, the Christian Motorcycle Association. And we were doing street ministry at a motorcycle rally in Gulfport, Mississippi. And the man that I was connected to was an older gentleman. And I let him lead the way because I was a, uh, uh, what did they call that? It was a clergy in training. I wasn't allowed to lead the charge with a group of people yet. So I start listening to this guy and everybody he's talking to. I just want to tell you, I'm just an old alcoholic. I'm just an old alcoholic. And it was every conversation. It was all about, I'm just an old alcoholic. Well, after about six hours of listening to that, it got up on my nerves. So whenever we were breaking for lunch, I just asked him. I said, let me ask you a question. I said, you just keep telling everybody that you're just an old alcoholic. Well, that's right, I am. I said, how long has it been since, since you've had a drink of alcohol? Well, it's been about 25 years. I'm thinking to myself, Lord Jesus, why are you still identifying with a dead man? That'll preach. Why are you still identifying with a dead you? My Bible tells me that whenever you were born again and that whenever you confess your sins that the Bible promises that God will cast 
The remembrance of those sins as far as it is from the east is to the west. And whenever you are water baptized, that your old man goes down into that water, but your new man comes up out of that water. So why do we still continue to identify our lives with, with a dead you? Why do you keep identifying yourself with, with something that you're not anymore? Well, I'm just an old alcoholic. I'm just a this, I'm just a that. Why are you still identifying yourself with something that Jesus died to deliver you from? My past is a testimony. I refuse to let it be a prison. You can either let your past and your history be your instructor or be your warden. It'll either give you insight or imprisonment, but it can't give you both. Quit letting people marginalize your purpose. How often have we found ourselves surrounded by people who seek to marginalize our gifts simply for the sake of self-preservation? Isn't it interesting how whenever you start to do better in life, that, that friends and family, oh, now you just think you're such a much. Yes, yes, I do, bless God. I thank God. I thank God that I'm not where, where I used to be. Oh, well, now you're just a Bible thumper. Yes, I am, because I stand on the Word every day because I know what I am without it. Folks want to constantly re remind you of who you used to be. And I, I can remember after I overdosed, I went back to every person that I remembered being at that party. And I began to apologize to them and ask them for forgiveness. I didn't know what I was asking for forgiveness for. I did not even know John 3.16 yet. I just knew that I had been born again and that that night God had spoke to me. And I can remember people going, oh yeah, Miller time. That, that, that was my nickname in high school, but it was not for a good reason. Yeah, Miller time, well, we'll give you six months and just see how long all this Jesus stuff lasts. Listen to me, baby. I'm going on 18 years strong, and I'm not looking back. I had a touch from heaven, and I don't care who tries to marginalize me. It ain't going to happen no more. Some folks in your life think that the world revolves around them. And that if it doesn't, then nobody else can get any sunshine. You need to stop hanging out with folk like that. God destined your life with a purpose, and it's his purpose and not theirs. And it is up to you to discover that and to pursue that. Man may seek to consolidate you, but the God of heaven is seeking today to celebrate you. So stop living in the past. It is time to write a seal of divorce of who you used to be and get comfortable with who God is calling you to be right now. Some may say, well, pastor, that's easy for you to say. You found your purpose and you're doing what God's called you to do. I don't know what, what God's purpose for my life is. Proverbs 25 and 2, it is the glory of God to conceal a matter, but it is the glory of kings to seek it out. You will never find your purpose with him if you don't first find your position in him. I'm going to say that again. You will never di di discover your, your purpose with him if you do not find First, find your place in him. This is why Paul said, I have been seated in Christ in heavenly places. And all authority has been given unto me in heaven and in earth and below the earth. Too many of us are living below our birthright because we don't know what the Bible actually says that we have access to. David prayed one prayer and God stopped the cosmos. He made the entire universe pause because David says, I, I've got to destroy my enemy today and the sun is going to go down before I get victory. You've got to help me. And God literally froze the sun in the sky. If God is no respecter of persons, 
And the same Holy Ghost that Jesus had is the, the, is the same Holy Ghost that you've got. Well, pastor, I don't believe that. Well, the Bible says otherwise. It says that the same power. I looked it up in the Greek, Bobby King, and you want to know what that word same means? The same. The Bible says the same power that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. Dwells. It doesn't just manifest on, it dwells in. So everywhere that you go, the Holy Ghost is with you. Some of y'all need the Holy Ghost to go to Walmart. Some of y'all need the Holy Ghost to start telling your tale to, to put the buggy back in the cage. I had to ask the Lord to forgive me yesterday because I blessed somebody out in Jesus' name for leaving a buggy right in a parking spot. I had to squeeze my hefty self out of my truck to keep from dinging the door so I could get that buggy out of the way. Help me to stay saved, please. <laughs> Point number two. <laughs> oh. There's a reason why in the book of Hebrews that it names the hall of faith and it says that, that Elijah was a man of like passions as we are, which means that Elijah had some Walmart moments. Well, I'm just saved and sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost. Well, you're filled with something. It might be a religious spirit, but it ain't the Holy Ghost. Because the Holy Ghost makes you tell the truth. I recently read a quote. It says that the Holy Spirit doesn't just enable you to speak in tongues and prophesy. It also enables you to shut your mouth, self-check, self-evaluate your life, and apologize whenever you're wrong. Ooh, Jesus, I can close my Bible. Point number two, do not let, listen to me now, do not let what you're doing keep you from going whenever the purpose of God is revealed. Do not let what you're doing, well, pastor, I'm comfortable doing this. I'm happy doing this. I, 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 I feel that I'm gifted in doing this. Yes, but are you forfeiting the will of God for your life for not going from what you're doing to do what he's going to do through you. Amos was simply walking about, walking out his purpose until God revealed his purpose. I want you to notice in this text that whenever the purpose of God was revealed, that the purpose of man was relinquished. Amos did not have to ask permission to do the will of God because God himself had told him what it was. Amos did not continue to live according to what had been because of what had been revealed to him concerning what would be. Amos had received a glimpse of the future and he refused, listen to me now, and he refused to let his yesterday write the headlines of his tomorrow. I'm going to say that again. Amos had received a glimpse of what the future was going to be. Therefore, he refused to let his yesterday write the headlines of his tomorrow. You might be broke yesterday, but that doesn't mean that you have to be tomorrow. You might be uneducated yesterday, but that does not mean that you have to be tomorrow. You might be addicted in your yesterday, but that does not mean that you have to be addicted in your tomorrow. It might mean that your marriage is on the rocks yesterday, but, but there's a God in heaven who's able in your tomorrow to change that headline. Stop asking your yesterday's for permission to do the will of God in your tomorrow. The Apostle Paul declared in Philippians 3, verses 13 and 14, Brothers, I do not con consider that I've made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, come on somebody, and straining forward to what lies ahead. Some of y'all need to emblazon that scripture across the mirror in your bathroom. 
I let go of what lies behind. I am willing to, to forget what lies behind me, and I'm willing to, to strain. See, some of us think that moving forward is easy, but Paul says, I'm going to have to strain on some things to move forward, that my progress forward is going to be difficult. I cannot be willing to settle in the comfort of my yesterday because it doesn't require me to strain. Paul goes on to say, he says, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the high calling of God that is in Christ Jesus. Amos learned the value of letting go of yesterday. And Paul learned that same value of letting go of yesterday. And we must learn the value of letting go of yesterday or we will never be able to lay hold of what God has for us in our tomorrow. Point number three this morning, Pastor Brad, if you'll come. If we never learn to let go, we will never learn to lay hold because you cannot lay hold of your future. Excuse me. You cannot lay hold of your future while holding on to your past. The purpose of man does not reserve the right to alter the purpose of God for your life, even if the purpose of man is a purpose that you manufactured. Too many of you are consumed with the opinions of people around you. I have a word for the Lord for you today. Are you ready? Shout yes. Stop it. If their opinions are not helping you pay the bills, then their opinions are moot. Come on, somebody. If their opinions are not helping you to to be a better you, then they are moot. Come on, somebody. If their words are not building you up and not affirming you and not helping you be transformed into the image of Jesus Christ, then their words are moot. The purpose of God is bigger than that. I want to share some thoughts here as we prepare to close. We serve a God of the along the way stages of life. Often we find our, or often we may find ourselves praying for the destination, but we must understand that there are things that we can only learn about God along the way. Whether they are about Him or even about ourselves, that are the most meaningful. Oftentimes, I know, including myself, we find ourselves praying, God, hurry up! And get me to that place that you showed me that you have predestined for me to be. But we negate the process because we don't see the benefit of the toll, of the flipping burgers, of the digging ditches, of the difficulties of our life. Church family, there are some benefits to not having enough. The Lord will take you the long way around. He'll show you the scenic route and allow you to learn things like patience and temperance and long-suffering and forgiveness and calmness and peace and even going as far as learning how to pray for yourself and, like Paul said, to be willing to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And when we finally arrive at our destination... When we finally arrive in heaven, as wonderful as it will be to walk those streets of gold and beyond the pearly gates and see the apostles and the saints of the ages and to discuss the hidden mysteries that have been sealed up in God in eternity past, I believe that we will find ourselves seating together, discussing the things that we learned about God along the way. So maybe much of what we pray for in life as we grapple with the destination, perhaps it's the Lord that slowed you down on purpose so that you can learn what you needed to learn along the way. God, hear me now, God cannot exalt a king that isn't ready to rule. God cannot progress you forward until you're ready to lead. God cannot exalt you if you've not learned what he intended for you to learn along the way. It's the equivalence of taking a child and writing out a math problem and then simply writing in the answer. They see the problem and they see the answer, but they don't see the process that delineates the connection between the two. 
And oftentimes we find ourselves praying, Lord, I have a problem, just hurry up and give me the answer. But it's that process of learning how to work algorithms and geometry and those things that, that teach us how to take a problem that seems insurmountable and figure out the, the process of navigating that problem towards the right solution. I'm reminded of Jacob with Rachel on their way to Ephrata. Whenever they were going along in the wagon, and the Scripture speaks that she lurched in labor and died in the back of the wagon, birthing a son. She named him Benoni, which means son of my sorrow. But Jacob comes and takes that boy. He hobbles off, and he names him Benjamin, which means son of my right hand. See, some people that were involved with birthing you have cursed you with a name. But there's a Yahob, there is a Israel, there is a one who's called greater than you, who has the ability to carry you away from a broken situation and give you a different name. Some people might have named you Benoni, but Jesus calls you Benjamin, Benjamin, son of my right hand. The interesting thing is that Benjamin was the son from whom most of the kings would stem from. Imagine that man trying to see a future when he's trapped with the words of a broken past. And many of us need our name changed today. I'm reminded of Moses whenever he began to tell the children of Israel about the land that God had promised them and that they had set out for that land that they had never seen before nor visited. And Moses promised them based upon the, the promises of the Lord that, th that this place would have grapes as big as stones and that and they would have their own houses and they wouldn't be slaves anymore. Little did Moses know that it wasn't as important to God that he made it to the promised land. What was important is what he would learn about God along the way. We have a God who believes and courses our life in a process, not with a destination. Yes, he is a God of purpose, obviously, but his purpose cannot be fulfilled if you're not willing to go through the process of preparing yourself for the destination. What about the two disciples who were traveling from Jerusalem to Emmaus and they were talking about the current events of the time of this Jesus of Nazareth who had been killed? And as they talked about the headlines of that day, they noticed a stranger approaching them. Thus, they began to discuss with this stranger about this Jesus of Nazareth and what had happened to him. And while they were on this seven-mile stretch of road, this stranger begins to reveal Christ the Lord in the Scriptures. And then they come near to their house. And the Bible says that he made as if that he would go further. But they beckoned him to come and dine with them. And as they sat at the table with him and they saw him in the breaking of the bread, it was revealed to, to them that it was Christ the Lord. And they said, whenever Jesus was revealed to them in communion, in the breaking of bread, they said this, did not our hearts burn within us as we walked with him along the way? I would dare to say to you, my brothers and sisters, that it's not the place that we hope to arrive at that is important. It's not the thing that you've been praying about that is important. It's not the breakthrough that you've been waiting on that is important. The thing that is most important to God are the things that will happen to you while you're waiting on Him along the way. It is the things that you learn about Him through the difficulties and the trials. We oftentimes quote this scripture, but we fail to remember one word. Isaiah said it was those who what? Wait upon the Lord. That they would renew their strength. That they would mount up on wings as eagles. That they would run and not be weary. That they would walk and not faint. And I want you to hear this today. That the prophet was not celebrating the running place. He was celebrating the waiting place. He was celebrating the pause. And sometimes God has to stop us dead in our tracks 
to get us to see not only what he's doing, but just how far you've come. It is interesting here that the prophets seem to be insinuating that it is the time of waiting and not the process of being able to run or fly or walk that matters. It's time that we celebrate the waiting places. Well, pastor, what about the season that we're in right now? Could it be that God is allowing us a prophetic pause to look around as a church body to see just how far that we've come, but also to take a moment to see what God has planned for us ahead. I don't know about you, but when I look back over my shoulder and I see from where he brought me from and I look at where he's brought me to, it blesses me. I'm reminded of the words of Paul his grace towards me was not in vain. The call of God that he had for my life was not in vain. I'm not perfect. I don't claim to be. But I'm thankful that what he brought me from. We must all today be willing to have the courage to say, you pray for him please that the same God, we all need to be willing to have the courage to say this, that the same God that brought me through my yesterday can bring me through my tomorrow. Well, Pastor, what do you think is going to happen? I don't know. All I can encourage us to do is pray and be prepared for whatever comes. But at the end of the day, if the same God and you hear me by the Holy Ghost, if the same God who can bring us through the difficulties of our past, through the brokenness of our past, through the problems of our past, through the lack of our past, if he's able to do that, he's more than proved himself to be able to take care of us through whatever comes. He's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we may ever ask or think notice now according to what according to the power that worketh in you in the big picture I, this is what I tell you that I feel is coming In the book of Exodus, it says that whenever the curses fell upon Egypt, that the curses never touched Goshen. That there was darkness in Egypt, but there was light in Goshen. That there were plagues and all of these things in Egypt, but there was protection and provision in Goshen. I believe that God is going to raise up His end-time, prophetic, Spirit-filled church, not religion, His church. I'm going to say that again. Not religion. He's going to raise up his church. And whenever there's darkness out there, there's going to be light in here. Whenever there is destruction out there and there is distress of nations out there, there's going to be power and peace and provision in here. My prayer has been, God, we're right on I-20. And there have been prophets for decades saying that there would be a revival that would sweep the nation and that I-20 would be a thoroughfare of His glory. Church family, we're we're less than 400 yards away from I-20. Lord, let it be here. Well, pastor, what about church growth? And what about, guys, I could care less about church growth. Well, we want to grow it. No, 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 stop. I'm concerned about growing you. If we're healthy, we will grow. But church, I am not focused on numbers. If Jesus can turn the world upside down with 12, I have no excuse to have global impact with the 500 that are in here. Amen. Amen.
I want to close with this statement and then we're going to get ready to close. When we all get to where we're going, it's not going to be about where you are. I'm going to say that again. Whenever we all get to where we're going, it's not going to be about where we are. It's going to be about the things that happened along the way. I've had people ask me, Pastor, why in the book of the Revelation does it say that every tribe, tongue, kindred, and nation will be on the sea of glass and everybody's worshiping Jesus for all of eternity? And people say, well, man, I have a hard time being geared up for a worship service for 30 minutes in a church. Yes, I hear you. But whenever you get to the end of your life and you get to your destination and you have some time in eternity to think about all that God brought you through and to look back over your life and to remember that God saved me in those firefights, that God saved me through cancer, that God saved me through sickness and disease, that God saved me through that broken season, that God saved me, me through those things that happened to me. Whenever we're able to look back and see all that he has done, you'll have more than enough for all eternity to give him glory for. It's not about the destination, church. It's about what we learn about him along the way. And just like Amos, some of us were taken. And just like Paul, some of you have a rough past. But I'm convinced that if God can use Amos and God can use Paul, God can use you. He's not done reaching towards us. It's time that we reach towards him.